I'm not quite as agile as I used to be. Now, uh, we will begin uh, with an extra company on stage in a moment. Is that a plane or is that me? <laughs> Well, if I'm not mistaken, the following remarks about acting are not something new coming from me at this point, but something that's wrong. Can you still hear me? Yes. Uh, but I'm really recalling at this point uh, my remarks about acting because of the presence here today of two important ladies who have consistently been part of the dark shadows phenomenon from the very beginning, and who, by the way, also witnessed the arrival and development of the character of Margaret Collins. After, excuse me, but I, I keep hearing things going on a lot, I hope that's affected you people. Is it working all right? It sounds like it's strange. Okay. But after four years of Dark Shadow's involvement so long ago, I had come to realize a curious but simple guidance for acting. A notion purely my own. And that is to say the lines intelligibly and with as much basic common sense as possible. And the viewers will do the rest. Thereby, thereby embellishing the performance with such stuff as dreams are made on. Each viewer or fan of Dark Shadows, or any show for that matter, brings to the performance his or her own reactions feelings, thoughts, and observations. That's the viewer I'm talking about. Thus blending myth and reality into whatever it is to be believed. <clears throat> I can recall hearing about an incident in my very earliest days with Dark Shadows at our Manhattan West Side studio. It was during a read-through of a fresh script one afternoon in the rehearsal hall prior to the next day's taping. Everyone present was stumped by a discrepancy in the script's plot regarding its relationship to a particular episode that had been aired many, many months ago or before. Something in, the, in that current day's script was out of line but nobody, including the director, could remember just what. The writers were called, but none of them could come up with an immediate solution. Production people as well were consulted. Still no help. At last, someone in the rehearsal hall had the bright idea to go downstairs to the sidewalk outside of the studio where fans gather every day to watch all the daily comings and goings, at once a fan was found who had the answer to the writer's dilemma. <laughs> now there it was acting. <laughs> a fan no less involved in the essence of acting. A total commitment to the existence of the Collins family and Collinsport Maine. Being myself a struggling professional actor, I was too busy trying not to trip over studio cables or trip over my lines or my ego to become involved at this time in the viewer's or writer's concept of the world of Collinsport. Now, I don't know if any of the company didn't find out exactly which fan had been so helpful down below on the street at that time. It could well have been, however, 
one of our special guests here today, Elena McCandler and Valerie Biasi. Well, either one of them could have been one of these people. Both veterans of the street, the street fan contingent. So it sounds like a street gang. But <laughs> <laughs> it was. Street uh, fan contingent of 1966. 67, a little thing I like to throw in here, which I didn't plan to do. But one time I got too smart, and they, they would come, you know, whenever we came down the stairs, they were up the street looking through the glass door, and they could see some of us way in the back. And if we came anywhere near the glass door, they'd be screaming. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to go out and play them, so I did. And I pushed the door, ah! <laughs> you do it trying to do an imitation of them. And the trouble was, they all spread out into the road. And, you know, well, enough said. <laughs> but they all survived. <laughs> so, I would like to honor the two of these people for their steadfast presence for so many years. Not only at festivals, but more your daily, for your, their daily presence outside the studio doors back in the late 60s. I would like to ask the two of you up on the stage right now to have a few words. Collins from 1795. <laughs> My fate was set. That was in June of 1968. I continued to go to the studio from that day to the day the dark shadows went off the air. Christmas vacations, I was there five days a week, Easter vacations, many, many days after school. And that really became my life, but it became lifelong friends as well. Not only Lena and I, who have remained friends, but Jonathan, who's always been more than a gentleman, and our friend Jay, who's here in the front taking pictures. It's been a great ride. And as we went through those days and we became closer to Jonathan, the days would come when he would ask us if we would participate in the fan mail work parties. Tens and tens of thousands of letters would come in, and so Jonathan asked us to participate in that, and so we did. And today is the anniversary of the first fan mail party, August 15th, and it was a Saturday in 1970. And when we walked into that rehearsal hall, which is where 
they had the fan mail party, what we saw was so much mail that we couldn't believe we would ever get through it all. There were boxes on the floor with the letters A to Z, and then mail bags piled up high like this. And it was incredible. It lasted so long that after a while we had to move it to a hotel. We went to the Hotel Edison in Manhattan, and that's where we continued doing the fan mail. Really unbelievable. It was, it was such an exciting time. We also went up to Tarrytown. We saw Jonathan do some of the scenes. We took photos there of him. We did a lot of different things with Jonathan. But the most famous thing that we ever did with him was at a Christmas party in 1970, we gave him a goof present, which wound up in many fan magazines because he hung it on the bulletin board in the studio. And to commemorate that, I had the shorts made again, Santa Claus thing about with Jonathan's name on it. And Jonathan, here you are. And all through these years, I have kept in touch with Jonathan. I've gone to a lot of the festivals, gone to his one-man shows. I, I, I went out to Los Angeles in 1991. Unfortunately, I don't fly anymore, so I won't go out there anymore. But I follow him, and I will follow him until these no longer exist. <laughs> I'd like to add, add to, the, uh, to the, the post office arrangement we made, we made up at the, on the studios on Saturday afternoon. There were about a dozen or two of you who were maybe 20 or I don't know how many, sorting out all this mail. But they all wanted to open the mail and see what it was all about. And I said, leave those in the I was like a policeman all afternoon, raising hell. <laughs> but anyway, we got it done. I remember Dan and Curtis came in, coming in one afternoon, and he couldn't believe what he saw with me up, with all these fans up on the, on the, on the second floor, uh, sorting the mail. And uh, but that was quite a phenomenon for me because uh, it went from the, the first time I ever knew there was any mail at all for me uh, was uh, when Dan came over one day with a little plate full of some letters, and I thought, oh, my papers, and I've been getting sack right now. <laughs> and he came in and said, Fred, these are for you. I said, what are they? They're letters. They letters from me. Families. <laughs> so I opened them and then went on from there. And I'll never forget that first time I saw fan mail in my life. And, uh, so ladies, thank you for coming. That was marvelous. We ought to go write a little book. Here, if it hadn't been for the, 
of the attention that we got from the world of viewers, of the world of fans. After all, it was you who made us what we are through your never failing attention. And so it occurred to me to make up for this neglect with a more formal and precise acknowledgement of what you people have brought to the development of dark shadows. With the game, you are now able to select your own favorite scenes from a collection of, well, over a thousand episodes of Dark Shadows through 1966 to 1971. And if all goes well, the game may continue to develop with a steady place in our future activities. Right now, simply enjoy what fan participants of the game have dubbed the most popular top ten winning scenes uh, on corner corny idea at even spell called the Fit Academy Awards. <laughs> <laughs> so away we go with a visual presentation at random, one by one, of the first ten scenes. So these are all done by a few people, people you know. Before we give you the winners in their proper place. So we're not into the winners right yet, but this is the development of the top ten of all the, the, uh, the tests we had with people all for quite a while. So in our first scene, episode 212, Barnabas meets young David at the old house. This is one of the ten top popular uh, episodes. Uh, I am a cousin, not a ghost, Barnabas warns him. And then, of course, there's the portrait of Josette that Barnabas must confront. So, take a look. Would you 
want me to show you around? Well, thank you, but that won't be necessary. But there are thousands of secret passageways upstairs. I know. You know? You mean you've been here before? No, but as I explained to your aunt, I heard so many stories about Collinwood when I was a child that I feel I've been here all my life. Well, what about the passageway that leads to a little room on top of the roof? A winding staircase. That's right! And the view of the sea beyond Widow's Hill. You've got it perfect. <laughs> and you know what that room's best for? Looking at the sea. Yes, but at sunrise, when the water, when the ocean, when the sun comes over the ocean, everything begins to change color, right in front of your eyes. Sunrise. I come out here sometimes early in the morning, before anybody knows I'm awake. Would you like to come with me sometime? Perhaps. Sometime. never seen anything like it. I'm sure. What's the matter? Why, nothing. What makes you ask? For a minute, you seemed sort of sad. Like you were remembering something that you'd lost a long, long time ago. But I haven't lost anything. I was talking about a sunrise. Maybe it was a sunrise that you saw, only at your home. And it makes you sad to think about it. Perhaps. Do you miss your home? I did, for a long time. But I don't anymore. something that even my own father loved. If his ghost is here with yours, tell him I've come home. I claim this house as mine. And whatever power you or he may have is ended. I am free now and alive. The chains with which he bound me are broken. And I return to live the life I never had. Whatever that may turn out to be. In this uh, next scene from episode two, three, three. Barnabas, by now having made the acquaintance of a few members of the modern-day Collins household, begins to spill the beans in the middle of a violent storm that reminds him of the circumstances of Josette's death. Take a look. Such as this, a night when a young, beautiful woman was pressed to her limits. She could no longer accept what the future held for her. She knew she had to destroy herself before she became something she did not want to be. She had quarreled with her lover. She tried to send him away, but he would not be put off. He tried to put his arms around him. But she broke away from him and ran out into the stormy night. The 
white dress contrasted against the darkness. He ran after her as she headed for the one place on earth that seemed to be designed for the termination of life. The rain drenched her. The winds bothered her, blowing her long hair wildly. Her clothing was torn with the low branches. The small white feet were bruised and mud-stained with the stony, cruel tattoo to the summit of the cliff. The shouts of a lover were lost in the wind as he moved swiftly after her. Near the top, she stumbled over a large rock. Crying hysterically, she limped and crawled to the edge of the precipice. Her lover reached her, clutched at her, spinning her around, pacing. Her eyes were wide with terror as the lover held her tightly, his lips pressed against her throat. Soon she grew limp, and he released her. Suddenly, with a, a last surge of energy, she broke free and hurled herself off the cliff. Her scream, reacting and echoing as she plunged down. Her body was impaled with a large, craggy rocks below. Her love descended to the body of Widow's Hill, found her body. Broken.
are not witnessing these scenes in any intended order yet. It is simply a collection of the winners that competed for top place. These are the ten who will get to the final results in a few moments. <coughs> that is to say the ultimate winner comes later. Meanwhile, another one of Barnabas' difficult confrontations here is an episode 290. This time with Julia Hoffman. <laughs> In this scene, Julia has confronted Barnabas in her room, telling him that she knows he is. Why did you tell your loved one you would come to me? I never told her any such thing. 
<laughs> well, again, World War II, these were all winners in their way, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> Barnabas has lured, in 442, Barnabas has lured the Reverend Trask. Oh, yeah. In the old house, blaming Trask, Trask for persecuting Nicky. Barnabas has him signed, Barnabas has him signed a letter declaring that Victoria is innocent. Barnabas then proceeds to carry out his punishment. <laughs> you're dead? Yes. But, but you're here. I don't understand. There's no reason why you should. Oh, it must have been a nightmare. I dreamed of Abigail. It must have affected my imagination. Perhaps you'll be pleased to know that your imagination is in no way Oh, but, but it must be. I heard voices calling you. Yes. Telling you to come here. How do you know? Was it a sound similar to this? Tress. Tress. Come to the old house. No. Victoria Winters. Miss Winters, she did no harm to you or to anyone. She, she's a witch. You know that isn't true. It, it is. You haven't the least idea of what true witchcraft is. What evils it has at its command. She is a witch. Only in your feeble mind, Trask. You wanted a witch to prove your own powers, so you hunted and tormented an innocent girl. No, I only did my duty. Your so-called duty compelled you to destroy me. You would destroy anyone for the sake of your own ambition. No, that's, that's not true. Oh, I could have pitied you, Trask. If you'd shown any pity for Victoria Winters, I would. But you never did. So I will show you no mercy. What do you say? Look. Simon. What's that? Your tomb. <laughs> no! You always have a claim to knowledge of the unnatural. The darkness. Well, here's where you will have unending lessons. No! No! No, you, you can't! I can and I will. No, I, I, I was wrong about Miss Winters. Were you? Yes. She, she is the witch. And why did you persecute her? The house. I see that the no harm comes to her. Please, I'll, I'll help her. She'll be free. Anything. Then you admit you persecuted her. Yes. Perhaps you would like to uh, submit that confession to paper. Yes. I, I, I write it. I thought you would welcome an opportunity to declare her innocence. She, she's innocent. She, she's not a witch. My hands trembling so. A few words will do. Yes. And a signature. Yes. Signature. I've done it. I, I've confessed. She's innocent. I've signed my name. Excellent. The tribal in <laughs> May I go? Soon. Very soon. Why? Why not now? The cause for final resting place is not yet ready. No, no, you can't kill me. I signed my confession. You confessed voluntarily. I never said I would free you. No. <laughs> you wanted Victoria Winters to die in prison, and so shall you. A prisoner of your own making. Oh, no, you can't. You can't. You can't. <laughs> So 
So we come to episode 462. A seance has ended, leaving Barnabas frightened. He does not know if Julia will protect his secrets. Take a look. I almost didn't recognize you. Oh, uh, again, brother. I'm sure I regret it. I must tell you how much I like your hair. You seem to be a little brain changing your image completely. You're no longer here under false pretenses. I merely substituted lies. You can hardly very well tell the complete truth, could you? Not without endangering you. Thank you. You're complimenting me, Barnabas. You must want something. Your kindness seems to make me more devious than I am, perhaps. You want to know what Vicky has told me? Well, are you willing to tell me? No. <laughs> then you will be placing Vicky in danger. That is blackmail, Barnabas. Why won't you tell me? Do you enjoy torturing me? No. You won't even let me see her. I want to protect both of you. Don't protect me, Doctor. Someone must. Very well, then I'll make a bargain with you. Help me and I'll leave the key alone. You don't trust me. I'd be a fool to. Say I just changed me. You don't know the panic that I felt when I saw that girl in Vicky's chair. When I looked at her and realized that it was Phyllis Wick. You knew her, of course. She was Sarah's governess until she was tried for witchcraft. Was she kind? She was to hang the day my coffin was carried to the mausoleum and chained. Barnabas, Vicky took her place. The past is constantly being revealed. If Phyllis Wick knew your secret, and so does Vicky. Uh, Vicky only remembers patches, no consistency to her story. She she lives moments, but she can't connect them. It's as if she were afraid of remembering all of it. Well, what would make her so afraid unless she knew about me? And dreaded admitting it was true. Junior, help me like you did before. Can't you go back to the time when we were friends, when we worked together? I, I don't know. Well, you were ready to save me then. Yes. Well, surely you see that my life completely depends on what she knows. If you won't let me, you must find out. I'm trying to. And if you succeed, will you use it to help me or hurt me? That depends entirely on you, Barnabas. I cannot count on you. I must do what I can myself. So we're coming along here to, and now to episode 550. Barnabas has discovered that Julia is under Tom Jennings' control. And so he's determined to find and destroy this vampire. Willie confronts Barnabas and forces him to admit that he cares about Julia more than he has admitted. Take a look.
why can't we find John Jennings? Where could he be? Where could Judith be meeting him? I found him this week. Look everywhere. No, we haven't known where to find him. I keep thinking that they're, they're meeting in some place I know, some place I've been overlooking. But could you destroy him, Barnabas? I mean, could you really? Well, what do you think I've been hunting him for? Well, I'm sure we cannot finish the experiment. Is that the only reason you're going to find him? Or what other reason could there be? Adam may come here tonight. He may demand to find out what how far we've got with the experiment. What can I say? If we do not do as he wants, he will destroy the key. You know that. I just think maybe you've got another reason, Marcus. Or what other reason? Oh, yes, he could kill the rest of the family one by one. He never threatens unless he is determined to go through with what he promises. Why did this have to happen when the experiment is so important? <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? Oh, Barnabas, you're, you're, you're talking about all the people except one that concerns you the most. I mean, the experiment, the be Adam, when you don't mention much as Julia. And she's the one you need the most. Obviously. I can't put together the parts of a body into a human with life and a breath. Barnabas, you just don't get what I'm saying. Are you being a flower? Oh, but you get the black marks of now whose secretary is missing. And I know that's how you don't feel. I mean, Barnabas, you're more than just worried about you. For a specific reason. Well, that's all I'm saying. If she goes on seeing him, she will die, and if she dies, she will be like him. But we must stop him. We've got to go out again. Oh, wait, where are you going to go? Through the woods again. Well, he's not there, she's not there. How could they be? Well, we can't stop it any with nothing done. Why, Barnabas? Why? What do you want me to admit, Willie? That I care for Julia more than I appear to. Always I will admit it. He's been a part of my life for so long, a very important part. And I must find him. Where could they be? Where could he be? Where could he be at this time of night so late? Yes, the docks. I remember the docks. Deserted, except the occasional woman hurrying home. Answered. Mr. Stoddard! Oh, I must see you, Mom. Elizabeth. They have it already. Oh, whatever. 
has happened here. Go, go to Angelique's room. Lock the door. I hope you can get back before. Before what, Julie? Perhaps they will be back. You're right. And if you escape them, when Don comes, you will come to my car to kill me. Oh, Julie. Who has saved me so often? What has he done to you? Nobody's done anything. Julia, you have been with him. He has done this to you. No! He has made you do this. Don't talk about it. Julia, why not? Are you so terrified of him? I told you to go and get And leave you to him. Leave me as the only chance you have. But why? Why is he so terrified that you can't mention his name? Say it, Julia. No. Say it. No. Then it will be my will against his. He's watching us. I know it. Somewhere outside this house, he's watching. He knows what's happening here. I just go. Look at me, Julia. Look at me. You can hear me. You will do as I say now. Look at me. Not him. You must depend upon me. <laughs> you must never blame yourself. <laughs> you have forgiven me so often for so many things. I'm afraid you must you know. Oh, no. Still has power of you, doesn't he? I know he's only waiting. And you will go to him again. I don't know. I will not leave you alone for one moment this night before dawn, because before dawn you must get back to where we came from. <coughs> Julian. You must use every ounce of willpower you have. You must. I will try. I know. You must go to the telephone and call Stokes. I, I think I should stay here, Barnabas. I, I should stay here in case the police come. Then I can tell the sheriff's come. Then I'll go there. Tell me. I will not leave you. Is he calling you again? Come, we must go to Stokes. We must find him. We must get the answers to the things we need before we go back. That's why we're actually to move now. Come. Not until we know more. You're right. If we can find out how to stop all this from ever starting, we will be whatever man does.
Reverend Trask has shot the now mortal Angelique. Before Barnabas has the chance to confess that he loves her, she dies in his arms. Enraged, Barnabas attacks Trask. <laughs> Matter of 
the inspiration of life or death. To lose a duel with you would be to lose everything. But you will never be able to love anyone who has a lost you. I was a colonist. Why didn't you protect me? Where were you when I was turned into something that even my own father loved? We just want to, on behalf of all the fans, thank you so much for being here. We, we so appreciate it. And we love you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What's your question, ma'am? Uh, Jonathan, I just wanted to let you know that my little five-year-old son wanted me to tell you that he's named after your character. His name is Bruce Barnabas Sellers. <laughs> and he loves his name. Is there a question? Well, basically, there's no more de uh, declaration there. Okay. What's your question, sir? Mr. Fred, I, uh, I don't have so much a question. I think on behalf of the fans, we all realize that you are an actor at heart and we have been enjoying you for decades now. And there are some of us, of course, that won't be here tomorrow. I will be here tomorrow, but a lot of people won't be here tomorrow to see your one-man show. And so, since you're an actor of heart, would you uh, take maybe a, a line of Shakespeare or Poe, or one of the, uh, uh, a line that you as an actor, or a scene uh, that's brief, that you as an actor love very much, and just give us a, a couple lines and a little, little performance. For well, well, that's not fair to ask for performance. Is there a single quote? Yeah, can you give me a single quote? I can't think of one. Well, I'm putting you on the spot. I mean, uh, uh, that was once uh, my favorite. Uh, Richard III, I've been living with for years. Now is the winter of our discontent. May the glorious summer of my this son of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon are not watched. All the clouds. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Thank you. I'll brush up about Shakespeare next time. Hi, Mr. Friend. I was wondering if you could share, I don't think you realized at the time when you were doing Dark Shadows that you and Grayson became one of the most dynamic duos of all time in the ranks of Sherlock Holmes and Watson. And you enthralled us so. So I'm just wondering if you could share just maybe a little something about you guys and on how you just, the chemistry was just so fabulous. Uh, are you referring to, to uh, the chemistry between you and Grayson? Can you call it? Uh, I can't think of anything on that. I, I, she, I, she was in much earlier than I thought. I thought she'd come in a long time after I came on, but she really had a, when I was reviewing all this stuff, I couldn't, I couldn't get over how many times, you know, she, she was very busy on the dark side of my problem. But don't know, she come on by me a lot of laughs together. Um, she had a great sense of humor, and and, uh, and she was kind of, we held each other's hands occasionally, you could see our eyes and keep the teleprompter. I think I was much better at that than she was, but when she wanted to lie, she just looked at the teleprompter. <laughs> and then she got on the more sophisticated about that, but at first she said, well, I've got to learn a lot. Thank anyway, you. no, I just pick up there. She was she was great to work with her. We we got along beautifully. Mr. Fred, I know that you're you were well known as a Shakespearean actor, but as a teacher of Greek drama, I, I wanted I thought that the game illustrated Aristotle's characteristics of a, a, a tragic hero and one of the reasons that the vampire Barnabas was such a tragic hero was because of his great fall, no longer having the daylight. And I wondered if you had it, had ever thought about the Greek Greek roots of of this, the drama. Uh, no, no, I, uh, by the way, <laughs> I, 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 I must have been. Did I do that? Uh, I, I, I am partly dead. Say, and I didn't quite think, do you see Barnabas as a trash? Oh, that's Barnabas Collins, not yeah. me. Barnabas. <laughs> 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 um, yes, yeah, well, I, I guess you'd call him a trash. Yeah. Yeah. It's the best description I've ever yeah. heard. I know you like that. Uh, you know, I like that. Thank you very much. Next question. Hello. I saw you at my first Dark Shadows Festival 16 years ago, and you still look great. Yeah. My question is, was it harder for you to do Shakespeare or Dark Shadows? I'm sorry? Was it harder for you to do Shakespeare or Dark Shadows? Well, there were different circumstances. When I've been in Shakespeare, you have know, a month or so to learn Dark Shadows every day. Okay. I found it really a very difficult part of my life when I first fell on with it. I must tell you a funny little story. Funny little story about a soap opera I was on before Dark Shadow. Somebody know, must know. As the world turns. Hmm? As, As the world turns. As the world turns. The world turns. <laughs> and I was, I was playing a doctor. And there's a couple. The lady was not well. And she was very. And her husband said, my dear, I, I, I've, got, I've got to come in and say, you don't tell me you've got to, you're getting a doctor. I won't see him, I won't see him. Well, he's on his way right now. And I was sitting at home, I didn't know so far. And I was sitting at home with my right now. Oh, here I'm sitting in my own house. <laughs> I literally was that stupid about it. And I looked at the phone and called up the network and said, am I supposed to be an honor or <laughs> And the husband said he's not on his way now. I positioned myself on the front lawn of their house. <laughs> I guess that's good ending. <laughs> Thank you very much for the Hey, Mr. Fern, I just, I just want to let you know that I enjoy Dark Shadows very much. I've got some episodes on DVD. I plan to get the whole collection and everything. I wanted to ask you a question, two questions. What part of Canada are you from and when was the last time you saw Alexander Mulkey and Nancy Barrett? Yeah. 
What part of Canada are you from? I come from Ontario. Oh, okay. So do we. Mom and Stephon, I, hope they, I must say, there's not hardly any difference between living in Ontario or living in upstate New York. It's okay. much the same. Although I am a royalist and uh, believe in all of that. And, and also, it's nice not being an American in a way because I can sort of get, take a view of it instead of having to say, well, I've got to be loyal, I've got to like this kind of thing. It's nice to be next door to the American United States. <laughs> Good neighbors. And, uh, but however, well, I never think about it. You know, like, when I was down 40 years you know, in the United States, and uh, it's all the same to be real, uh, except that we do have certain routines or, or uh, things that we honor are different, a little bit different, but not that much. Yeah. Uh, one, a lot of my ancestors have come from the States or came from the British Isles over to the States and settled there and came up to Canada. Oh. So there's a lot, and I have a lot of free customers down in, in various places in the, in the New England area. Yeah. And so, you know, I, 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 sometimes the only thing is when I'm trying to get past the, 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 the borderline, <laughs> I have sometimes a little trouble there. <laughs> so, but otherwise, um, when did you see uh, Nancy Barrett and Alexander Mulkey last? When did you last see your castmates Alexander Mulkey and yeah. Nancy Barrett? And what about you? When did you last see them? Oh, gosh. Has it been years? 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I know. I haven't seen them at all. No, I don't think I have. You know, you move on. You know, not that I've had a business career. You know, I've been doing a lot of other things. And, uh, no, I, I kind of lost touch with Moose Dark. Louis Sedman was a great friend of mine, but, you know, after yeah. the Dark Shadow was over, uh, John Carl occasionally, uh, especially when I went out west, I can't remember the moment. But uh, we're always, all actors are in the same boat. We just go from one thing to another. You know, we're never at the stall of center of people. We do people who live in New York and work in New York and only in New York. So they have this kind of group thing, but I've been all over the place. You know, um, um, I must say about the United States, just even in Canada, I've only seen about ten minutes of it where I do. The United States, I've done two good thing, things in my life. That I'll never forget, forget, of course. One, that I was on the, uh, uh, um, oh gosh, I forget. By the way, I lose my memory of what's going on there. I can't think of what I'm talking about. But, but two things I liked about the United States, two things I did. I was in a, a, in a, in a, in a Broadway show on the road. What did they call them? Matt? Repertory. You know, a touring company. Who you are? Arsene and Old Man. Anyway. It's our single place. And I went to all the biggest towns, the biggest cities in the United States. Without exception, all of the great cities in the United States. And be there, not mentioned going on a vacation like this and getting paid to do it. And, and you know, we'd do the shows at night and we'd have, I'd be in San Francisco for six weeks in San Francisco. That's, it's a beautiful holiday. Because we knew by that time we'd do the show. And have something to do with that theater show. So I like I love that whole aspect of, of the United States. And then the other side of the point is that when I was um, doing my readers' theater, it would just be one one shot shows of all these colleges and small places all over the United States. Totally different from the from the one where I was in all the big towns. This time I was in all these beautiful little Cities, towns, and cities, they're usually campuses. I mean, there's all university towns all over, from all over all quarters of the United States. I've been practically everywhere in the United States. So, those are the two things that I've loved about this country that I've got around. I mean, I've got more work here than I did in Canada. <laughs>
I love you enough for that. <laughs> and also, to, to see so many beautiful that New England just brought me crazy. I want to stay in these little towns. And sometimes I was there for a couple of days doing some like, reader series. But my, those two things about my life that I love is, is that I did stage acting, professional, the usual, but, and I was also doing my reader series. I'll be doing all that tomorrow, in fact, in a sense. I'll be doing live. One, one I, I, I look forward to all of you who have not seen it yet. It's called uh, My Brilliant Connections. And that's one of the best recordings I've ever done. And uh, I hope you enjoy it, if those of you who will be here tomorrow. Um, so many of the best story. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fred. You're welcome. Okay. And, uh, sure. Mr. Fred, I uh, uh, don't have a question. I just want to say that, in my opinion, nobody but you could play one of his songs. Johnny Depp may be a chapter. We'll see. <laughs> I can't play Barbara's comments, that's true. I have painted your portrait. If it's all right, may I please give it to you? Yes. Better than what she uses. I'm sure if you draw somebody to take them. You want me to sell it? Wow. Why doesn't the next person ask the question? Take your time. Oh, you're just giving it to me. Uh, that was a summer, that was before Dark Shadows. 
is not And she's a lovely woman, you know. Fun and full of beans. I don't have a nice story about that. My little invitation of it. I went up on my lines one time to your show, just a small little thing. But enough, we were all together off the scene. When we got on the wings, I said, Oh, Catherine, I'm sorry. Oh, don't worry about it, John. Whenever you know you lose a line, just look at me. I learned my cards in one long poem. Just keep on going. Beautiful line. Typical of her. She was a lovely woman. Thank you. Thank you for my pleasure being covered. No, you were not. You're not on the line. You're not on the line. It doesn't matter, Catherine. The line will probably end up with that. Hi, my question is, um, of all the women on Dark Shadows that you've been, you know, uh, which one did you love the most? Angelique, Josette? Well, we were always asking them. <laughs> no, I'm not going to answer those. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, 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 Mr. Frank, you know, just a quick question. Did you ever do some volunteer reading for some services for the blind? So why, and most of like what would you stay within an arsenic and all this? Have you ever done any reading for the blind recordings? Uh, I don't recall offhand, but I think I have, I know that certain charities. As for blind, it uh, seems to me I did that's so many years ago, but I haven't done very much lately. And what was it like working with uh, Gene? What was it like working with Gene Stapleton and Arsenic and all In fact, I remember just, just to finish off with the people of the blind. Is that I, I do, I know I've been, because I remember thinking how sensitive they are to anything you say. I, I don't remember, but I can't remember where or what under or what I was doing. Just have to remember the experience of, of, of reading to the blind and uh, how intense their, their ears are. Okay, but listen, I think maybe this line will keep on going. Yeah, we have time for one more question. One time. Can you give us a hint if you're going to be appearing at all in the new Dark Shadows movie with Johnny Depp? Yeah. Oh, well, not necessarily, though. I mean, I certainly like this. Please don't. No, I just want to come here. We'd love to see you in. Yeah! Yeah! Want me to stick my nose in the middle? Jonathan, if you'd like to have a seat. In fact, I lost this this afternoon. You couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> Can I steal one last question? Why are you lying in the bathroom? Oh, no way. <laughs> As an actor, Mr. Frigg, what single piece of advice would you give another actor? It's like going off to China and asking, talking to somebody in China. I don't know. Everybody, every person. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. You deal, you deal. The person that you're working with that day, I have, never, I have no idea how I do it, frankly. Except that I can remember, all right, I'll, do, I'll, I'll give you a kind of an interesting example. It was down in Georgia about 10 years ago, and it was somebody helped me, but it doesn't matter. Play, and that's my first story. I'm, I'm a directing Lion graduate from Jacob. Lion and Winter. Lion and Winter. Lion and Winter. And, winter. and you know how, how, I'll tell you how I have a time to answer the question. Uh, dealing with a group of actors, not one actor. But I love doing that play, and uh, in fact, Marie Wallace was a little bit. But I was a kind of a crazy director. I I had everybody read the script, I think, once. And then I took the scripts away and we talked about the play. What what did you say? What did you say? What did you say? So 
right away we got into, instead of learning your lines, it was a question of getting the essence of each character. And uh, we'd read it, we read it. In fact, a couple of you may be, I even went so far as to read it, haven't read it twice, once every two weeks or something. But essentially, it was, it was uh, we didn't know our lines for quite a while. These two were called upon. I didn't call upon them. We learned their lines. We just talked about what you do and how, how, do, how do you react to this character. I had them all working like that. And uh, some of them got a little bit iffy about that. That's not the way they do it broadly, you know. So, so, but uh, I remember doing that, and, and I had all the people uh, constantly learn, learn your lines. Don't learn your lines. I would not have that phrase to be said even. It's just get with the character. What do you, what do you go after that person for? Why? I said, sometimes we sat around with, in a room. That was the way I directed. I, I haven't directed very much for all of my law of being a directing major from Yale. But um, I could have been a good director, I think, if I'd stuck with it. I like doing it. I like working with actors. For that very reason, just to pull up the, the person's personality and use it for what it's worth in these characters. And uh, I like I like have a great time. I think we ever drove Murray crazy half the time. Oh, I loved it. Oh, my God. Thank, thank you. Now, Jonathan, we want you to stay put while we bring up some friends on stage. Please welcome Johnny Carlin.